This is Brush Radio, our number one business radio broadcasting from the city of Lagos. This Sunday morning, as it is our tradition, to bring to you the undiluted word of God under gospel hour, the power to get world. My pleasure to anchor this morning the message from the Lord. Let us have a word of prayer and make a progress. Our Father and our God, we thank you this morning. We thank you for life that you have given us. We thank you for health that you have showered us with. We thank you for the special privilege of being called your children and you calling us children unto yourself and we call you Father. Once more, we know it's a privilege. We do not want to take it for granted. I receive unction on behalf of myself and I receive understanding on behalf of everyone that will be hearing me now as we go live and also those that were here along the line, along the time, over a period of time, as this message is deposited in the electronic media and soft media. Once more, thank you. Thank you for great things you have done in time past. We are happy to hear from people the impact of this platform. I want to thank you for the owners and organizers of this platform and what you have used them for all this period. Once more, we give you glory in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. I am very happy. You ask me why I'll tell you. First, because life is extended to me. I am conscious of the fact that a lot of people who desire to see this day did not see this day. If you are one of them that is alive, would you mind saying thank you, Jesus, for preserving your life once again? That's where I am led this morning to discuss issues that has to do with life on this side of the divide. I have a topic of interest and I entitled it Built to Last for a Lifetime. Built to Last for a Lifetime. And I'm sure your mind is going left and right, up and down. What could it be? Is there really anything that is built to last for a lifetime? Is it not made by human? Maybe if it is made by human, how on earth would it be built to last for a lifetime? But let's save your gaze, save your gestulations, listen now, and we will arrive at how this topic came about. Let us read the word of God. I'm reading the first portion of the Bible from Matthew chapter 19, verse 3 to 10. And I read. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not prayed uh, that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave. I want you to take the name, take note of that word, cleave, to his wife, and they twin shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twin, but one flesh. For what therefore God had joined together, let no man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, and to put away, put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall marry another, sorry, and marry another, committed adultery. And whosoever marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. A disciple said unto him, If the case of a man be so with his wife, it is no good to marry. Praise the Lord. This is a story I believe you have read before. If you're a Bible scholar, Jesus was accosted by the Pharisees as it is their tradition. Most of the time they're asking questions to put him into trouble, so they think, because they want to catch him advising against the law of Moses. And Jesus had always been smarter than them. In this case, the matter was that of marriage and divorcement. And the question was simple. Is it lawful for any man to put away his wife for any reason? 
and Jesus took them headlong. Jesus said, no, it was not so from the beginning. Two words come to my attention. It says, for that reason, for such reason, a man shall leave his wife, sorry, his, his family, his mother and father, and cleave to his wife. Leave and cleave. I think sometimes, some, some years ago, we handled this leaving to cleave from the studio. That's where we are taking off from. Now, I have also explained, and I'm going to explain again, what cleaving means. Living and cleaving. But before then, my curiosity was aroused when I hear that a man will leave his father and mother and then cleave to his wife. And I said, I thought it's women that leave their father and mother to come and cleave. I thought that it's women that carry their luggages after the wedding to come and stay in the family of the man. I thought it's the women that change their names all to become one with the man. Why is God talking about, why is the Bible talking about a man living? Do men leave their father and mother? I thought they stay with their father and mother. It's a woman that lives. But please take note that there is a living and there's a living. The living of a man from his father's house, number one, is both physical and psychological. I've come to know that most broken homes, most marriages that did not work was because the man did not live. Not the woman. The woman must have left. After all, she carried her luggage on that day and changed her name. She had left. The person that needs to live now is the man. And what do you mean by that? Is he going to leave his father's name? No. This first living is physical and psychological. Let me take the physical aspect of it. The Bible marriage pattern, permit my expression, is more of nuclear. It's a nuclear family. There's nothing wrong about extended family. We're encouraged to be with our extended family. But it is nuclear in the sense that you and your wife and the children form a tree, form a branch of the main tree. It is not a branch in the sense of the branch of a tree. It is like a seed that fell from the branch and germinated on its own. There's a relationship. The more you understand it this way, the more you stop going to bring in your brothers when there is a misunderstanding between you and your wife. I'm talking to the men. That's the first problem where it comes. If you have left your father and your mother, you are not going to tell, the, tell them that your wife did not give you food the other day. It's not important. It is only those that are still attached to their mother and father that carry the problems between them and their wives to their family. Both of you are adults, consenting adults to marry. You should be able to solve your problem. I'm not talking against your taking it when it got, got into your, no, your neck, no. But I'm saying that you need to leave the apron strings of your family. You need to leave your mother. You need to leave your father psychologically to work a home with your wife. Most homes, most problems that I have seen in the family, by the special grace of God, I've been a counselor of marriage and family over the years. Most of them originate from not living by the man. Live. Your mother loves you, and I believe you love your mother. Every man loves his mother. Oh, I know that. I love my mother. But there is a time to leave your mother. That doesn't mean that she won't give her her own seat. There is a seat meant for your mother. Give it to her. Give her her due respect. But things concerning you and your wife has to be between you. Living is important. That's the, the, the psychology of living. And of course, the physical living is to form your own nuclear family. 
such that if there is an issue, you can solve it yourself. And then cleave. Now, the easiest way I can explain cleave to you, take two sheets of paper, maybe two A4 sheets of paper. Get gum, the paper gum. Apply it on one face of the paper. Put them together. Leave it for one hour. And try to separate the two. What happened is that the paper had cleaved to one another. Any effort to separate it cannot happen. You will end up tearing it. Tearing it. And that's exactly what happens in marriage. And that's why we advise that for you, before you say, I do, make sure you have settled in your mind that you are doing. Marriage is not such that you get in and get out. Marriage is not that. So cleaving means such sticking together, such that any effort to separate both of you will suffer very big damages. That's why divorce cases are very bad. You have stayed with a person for a period. You have joined your life together, so to say. You have done everything together. And all of a sudden, Satan came in between. Why did I use Satan again here? Satan knows very well how God values a family. That's why when he came to fight God, he knew he wouldn't fight the Almighty God. He fought the first family by deceiving Eve. And Eve deceived Adam. And we found ourselves where we are. He knew that the family is important to God. The family is the foundation of the home. And is the foundation of the country. Every family has its roots. Every person that talks, every person that lives has its roots in the family. So Satan has it better. That's why he attacked the first family. Is he still attacking the families? Yes. The attack has come in different forms. How on earth would a man look at a fellow man and look into her eye, into his eyes and say, I love you and I want you to be my wife? How on earth would a woman look at another woman and say, I love you, I want us to marry? And they shamelessly go to court and marry in countries where they are allowed. And I have always said, I don't care really who you marry, but please, when you are marrying, Marry the product of your type. I would like to see you marry that child that was born out of a relationship between a man and a man. I want you to marry that girl. I mean you that says you have a right to marry. You don't come to marry products of a heterogeneous relationship when you are interested in marrying a fellow man. That's it, an attack on the family. That one is, I don't even know how to talk about it. How I wish they ended up like that and we say they're unbelievers. But do you know that there are people who are called gay bishops, openly gay bishops, and they shamelessly sit on the front seat in the church and say they are man and wife, two men. I even can't imagine what they do in their closet, in the darkness, in the rooms. It's, 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 it's unthinkable. So what do they really do? I leave that for you to begin to imagine. Cleaving means sticking permanently together. Then this relationship is not meant to be broken. Any effort to break it causes more problem. He will cleave to his wife, and two of them shall become one. I have also come to observe, I have observed, that most successful marriages over the years, they begin to look like each other, even physically. I give you that assignment to watch. You begin to see a man and his wife looking like brother and sister. I'm talking what I know. My wife is, a, is, is black. The skin is black. I used to be fair as a young man. Uh, the hardness of this street life had darkened me. But when I saw my wife, my attraction to her was because she was dark. And I love her because she's black. Opposites are trapped. But if you see my wife now, she has almost become as fair as I am. The reason is that we have shared life together, done everything together. And my complexion has rubbed off on her. And hers has rubbed off on me. So characters are supposed to be. We are supposed to 
improve together. So every effort to separate causes problem, causes more problem. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, in the beginning, oh, the Bible says Jesus created the world. He said nothing that was made that was not made by him. That is Jesus. And Jesus was referring them to the beginning. He said in the beginning it was not meant to be so. For he who created them, created them male and female. He didn't create them male and male. He didn't create them female and female. He didn't create them goat and man. And there are people who are into Christianism. I don't forget the story. I read. One man said he had had series of failed marriages with human beings. And decided to marry a goat. And he went and married a goat. Dressed a goat like a human being is. Google it on the internet, you get it. Dress a goat and wedded the goat. He had children from the third relationships. And one journalist asked him, Your children from other marriages, how did they accept it? How did they accept goat as their stepmother? He said, Whether they accept or not, it's not, it's not my business. It's my life. That's what he said. And they said, Then how does it look like to live with a goat? And call go to your wife. He said, well, uh, it's very obedient. It's easier to manage than most human beings. The only thing is that whatever is aside, he eats, she eats it. I said, that's good for you. You put down your money, your, your wife goat eats the money. If you drop soap, your wife goat eats the soap. If you drop soup, it comes to lick the soup. Control it now. You are looking for uh, dummy to control. Clothing, clothing requires that you stick together. And it is made permanent. By the way, remember that the topic is built to last for a lifetime. And what are we talking about? The marriage is built to last for a lifetime. Now, let's look at a few other scriptures and then take it up. When there's problem in the family, I have identified a few things that cause problem so that you can address them. And I have, I have indirectly talked about interference of the extended family. Because when a man runs back to his mother, to his father, to his brother, to complain about his wife, he has invited them into the problem. It's an interference, even though you created it. When you cleave, there's no room for such. That's one of the issues that cause problems. For the young couples, I have often heard them complain about sex. The man says, he doesn't give me sex as I want. And I said to both of them, while it's a problem now, in years to come, it won't be a problem. Because you have enough of it. Oh, yes, you have. When you're approaching your 40s and 50s, she becomes more like a sister than your wife. Because the urge to do every now and then will, will go. Nature will not let you continue like that for years. So let that man, if you have that as a problem between you and your wife, please endure. Time will soon come when you will not even want to. Because nature must have its course. So we can solve that problem. But there is a scripture for it. The Bible says to the man, your body is not your own. She is the owner of your body. Says to the woman, the, uh, his, your own body is not your own. He is the owner of your body. That means whenever he wants it, he should have it. Whenever she wants it, she should have it. There is no denial of intimate relationship between couples, according to the Bible. That's the Bible for you. Now, the other things that causes problem is money. Money could continue to cause problem all through the life of a family. But it shouldn't cause problem. Number one, God did not want a confusion anywhere. God has made the man the breadwinner. God has made the man the provider. The woman is structured to receive. Everything about the woman is to receive. So if your wife is demanding, please say it that she is wired to by nature. That's what she is. So she is doing what she's supposed to do. I pray for you, man. I pray for you, the head of the home, that God will bless you such that when they ask, you have to give. That's the prayer I would like to pray for you. 
Let me give you, let me tell you something interesting. To the woman, her understanding is her own money is her money. And your money is also her own. <laughs> I repeat it. The woman feels that her money is her money. And your money is also her own. That is the thinking. That's how they, that's why if you ask her how much she earns, you may be looking for trouble. But she'll be interested in how you spend your money. But when there is enough money, there's no problem. So I pray that you have enough money to pick up matters of the family. Money is an issue. Family financing, so many things have, so, so much of it, problems have come from there. But let me give you a few ways out. There are families that have joint accounts. There's nothing bad about it. If your wife agrees to a joint account, that's beautiful. Particularly if you agree, that's fine. It seems to lay the card on the table for everybody. But some families are not able to operate one. But bear in mind that whatever system you want to operate to run the family is allowed so long it brings peace. Some people say, I have my money, you have your money. I have my bank account, you have your bank account. When there is a need in the family, we may contribute money together and do it. Wonderful. If your wife agrees, I keep saying if your wife agrees, that's a good one also. Some other families say, contribute a percentage of your income into a common post. And I contribute into a common post from where we solve needs. That's a wonderful one. I know of a family, a friend in particular. The wife says, I'm going to take care of everything about food in the house. Don't bother yourself about food. Take care of capital expenditure. That we eat in this house is my business. And if you go to that house, there's peace. I love that also. What am I saying? There is no formula that is acceptable to all. Whatever formula that brings peace should be used in family funding and family financing. If your wife decides to say, it's your business, you are the man of the house. I don't give a damn about where the money is coming from. Leave me alone with my money. My brother, if you want peace, leave her alone with her money. That's where I'm coming from. So if money is an issue in the family. I have talked about the in-laws and interference. These are issues, but we can solve them and we do solve them. What we have in view is peace. Whatever that brings peace, let it be. The peace of the home is important and is paramount. I will say that. Now, in the course of my many interactions with families, particularly the ones that are having problems, two major issues arise. Number one, the man says, he is not, she is not submissive. She is strong-headed. She doesn't obey me. She doesn't reference me. This is the language of the man. The woman says, he doesn't love me. He used to love me when I started, and I believe that he loved me, but he doesn't love me any longer. Now, do you know that both of them are right? The Bible says, man, love your wife. I still kept wondering why I thought women are a bundle of love. God would have said, man, woman, love your husband. But no, he says, man, love your wife. And face the woman and say, submit to your own husband. My emphasis, the emphasis of King James Bible there is your own husband. And I know why. It is easier for a woman to submit to her boss in the office than her own husband. It's not a woman that calls the boss, sir, and comes home and calls the husband named. That's no submission. But the Bible knew that submission would, have, would, would, would be more difficult in the home because it don't see you finish. We find it difficult to submit. Young woman, please submit. That's what the Bible expects you to do. My friend, please love your wife. The Bible knew why it gave these two different functions. Now, what the problem most of time, most of the time, comes is he doesn't love me. 
It's not submissive. Now, which one comes first, the chicken or the egg? If you leave these two parties, the man says, if he doesn't submit, I will love him. The woman says, if he doesn't love, I will submit. There must be a dividing line. Something must be said about it. So where are we coming from? Let me read a Bible portion for you. Ephesians chapter 2, sorry, chapter 5, verse 22 to 29. I take it to 33. Wife, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, and even as Christ is the head of the church, and is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is sub subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husband, be their own husband, everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that the, he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, for that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He loved his wife, loved himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but Lord nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, every man of every one of you in particular, so love his wife even as himself. And the wife, see that you reverence your husband. Oh, the Bible is beautiful. The Bible is every day a reference material. Whatever problem the Bible cannot solve does not exist. Say, I told you. Now, very simple. Wife, submit unto your own husband. I have emphasized that. And he went back to say, um, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church, loved the world. Now, let's, let's look at it. How did Christ love the world so that we can solve this problem of egg and chicken permanently and once and for all? How did Christ love the world? Christ loved me while I was a sinner. He didn't wait for me to become saved before he loved me. He loved me while I was a sinner. Now, that makes it that the love thing, the love submission in Broglio between a man and his wife, the man as Christ loved. How did Christ love? Christ loved me while I was a sinner. He died for me. He didn't die for me as a saved person. He died for me to save me while I was a sinner. Now, that makes it that the love comes first, though. Men, I know you will not like to hear that. You are telling me your wife must submit before you love your wife. But the Bible says, as Christ loved the church, as Christ loved me, he didn't wait for me to change before he loved me. I submitted to him after he had redeemed me. So that settles the matter. Fellow man, husband, Please do not expect your wife to submit before you love. I know you don't like it, but that is the Bible. I, 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 I make haste to say it. I'm a fellow man, and I face the same situation. It says, and you please your wife. Now, let me tell you, what is animal husbandry? Animal husbandry, for where you get husband from, is the practice, the science of making an animal productive by taking care of it. It says to me that if you are a husband to a woman, it's your business like the man who is practicing animal husbandry to take care and make your wife productive. I know you wouldn't like me to say this, but that's the truth. So if your wife is not productive, if your wife is not productive, I repeat it, hold yourself responsible to a large extent. Of course, we know that there are stubborn wives. I have seen some. But the truth is, as Christ loved the church. Now, having said that, 
a, a lack of love and submission, and I have explored to us the issue of love and submission, how it must be treated. Only men marry. Therefore, shall a man leave his family? It tells me that boys don't marry. Marriage is for men. Oh, yes. <laughs> That person who says, I can't take this shit. No, I will never take it. No, you have not married. If you marry, you take some shit. Oh, yes. And it's for men. This is men's talk. It's not women's talk. So every person that must marry must first be a man. That's when provocation will come. And you stomach it and walk away. You don't raise hand. By the way, if you're in the habit of beating your wife, you are a boy. I care not. No man beats his wife. The Bible says nobody hates himself that he could beat himself. If you fail yourself, do you beat yourself? If your wife has become part of you, you must have to take her in, tolerate her, take her in as, as much as you will, and continue to pray, thank God that we are Christians, and continue to work on her. Pray for her to be submissive, but you need to love her. So, boys don't marry. Marriage is for men. Whenever I see a man beat his wife, I say, this one, a boy. He's a boy that just married. Boys don't marry. Men. Always. And you say, you don't know my wife. Like one of my friends said to me, you don't know my wife. That's why you're talking. Your wife must be a very good woman. I say, yes, my wife is good. You don't know my wife. <clears throat> my wife will never submit. My friend, you are a husband, and husbands tend to take care of, provide for. So, men only marry, boys don't marry. So, the business of marriage, Jesus says, it was not meant to be separated. In the beginning, it was not so. This business is built to last for a lifetime. Only effort to tear it apart while you are both living will create problem for both sides. It is like clothing and trying to separate. So you now understand that this is built to last for a lifetime. And so in the same Bible where we are reading, the apostle says, it would have been better than that we don't marry. And Apostle Paul said to them, ah, if you can endure it, but if you have chosen not to marry, make sure you don't get yourself into adultery and fornication. Your judgment will be more severe because a provision is made for it. And then you say, I don't want. So this business is only for men. Only for men. The business of marriage is only for men, not for boys. It is meant to be for a lifetime. Now, my brother, my, my friend, I would like to pray with you. And I believe God that if you will put your mind to make your marriage work, it will work. Let me share a very personal testimony with you. My first daughter is married. A young man... She introduced to me as a person to marry her. I took her in, asked her a few questions. And when I was assured by her that she would be happy under him, I reminded her what I have told her about marriage. If you can't take this man as your head, there's no need to marry him. He said, she's okay. And we started the traditional um, yes, rites, and we did all. And I don't want to tell the story of what we did, but there was an interesting aspect of it. The very Saturday that they were to wed in the church, and my daughter had packed her things, ready to go to the husband's place from the church, which is our tradition. As she packed her box away, I began to joke with her. I said, Chica, do you mean you're leaving me and going? 
She looked at me, tears dropped from her eyes. Oh, you are so strong that you leave daddy and you are going to another person. She put down her head. I patted her at the back and said, it's okay, it's okay, I understand. But let me tell you one hard fact that you must take. As you're leaving this room, you are the owner of this room. We call it Chica's room. Tonight, I'm going to give this same room to your junior sister. It won't be your room again. I will rename the room. There's a visitor's room downstairs. When next you come, you will be in the visitor's room. If, she, if, if your sister decides to accommodate you or both of you want to stay here, well, pick, take note that the room doesn't belong to you again. You're going to your own home. When you go there, make that your marriage work. I never told her something like that before, but she was touched. In a way, there's no room for you here in your father's house as a daughter any longer. When you come next, you come as a visitor. It's called visitor's room. That's where you're going to stay. There'll be no room for you upstairs because upstairs is fully occupied. There are four rooms upstairs and each of them is occupied. There are two rooms, three rooms downstairs. One is called visitor's room. So you become a visitor in Anyamu's house. Go make your home, build your home. All that it takes for that home to work, that's what I pray for. And I prayed with her. And that was her going out of the house. I have not, and I will not interfere in things concerning them, except if they bring it to my attention. But as for poking rules to find out how they are living, I don't care. I care, yes, but I don't care in the sense that I won't do that. I will not interfere. Thank God they are living peacefully. The young man is doing well. Both of them are doing well. But that was the message I needed to pass over to her. Whatever it takes for this your marriage to work, let it work. You have seen me and your mom. We have managed ourselves. You have seen us in and out. You have known us in and out. Go do likewise. This marriage business is not for boys. It's for men. That's a summary of it. And it is for a lifetime, built to last for a lifetime. I'd like to pray with you two prayers now. The first prayer is those that would like to give their life to Jesus. If you didn't give your life to Jesus, all these things I'm saying won't work for you. It will only work for you because I'm using the Bible to explain things. If you don't follow me with the Bible, it will be of no use to you. So I give you the first privilege to give your life to Jesus. You have no given, want to surrender your life. That is the beginning of this relationship with God. God will now order your steps, help you that your marriage will work. Your marriage needs to work. If not for anything, for the sake that God says he hates divorce. If you love God, you must love what he loves. If you love God, you must hate what he hates. Number two reason is for the sake of the children. Go to Ojoeleba. Every child under that Ojoeleba bridge, sleeping on that bridge, if there are ten of them, seven of them are from broken homes. And I'm being liberal with the number. I believe all of them. For the sake of the children. But I'm going to pray. Put your right hand on your chest if you want to give your life to Jesus. Our Father and our God, thank you for these ones that are putting their right hand on their chest. They have had testimony. They have had me explain the word to them. They have also had me say to them, God needs to come into you and help you for your family to, to, to be the way God wants it. Without being born again, it's not possible. It's not easy to run a Christian home. Father, I thank you for each and every one of them. Receive them. Receive them. Remove their names from the book of death. Transfer their names into the book of life. My joy will be on that day when we shall embrace each other and remember this day for good. Once more, we thank you. Thank you for every one of them that have given their life to, to you today. You will keep them. Thank you for that. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. The second part of the prayer is a prayer about families that have problems. You are a man. You are a woman. You are not having it easy with your wife. And you have just listened to me. You had wished you have a good family. 
Maybe you look at the family of your parents and you say, how I wish my family is like that of my parents. Even if you were divorced. I have seen divorced cases coming back again. I would like to pray with you. Put down your head if you have a problem with your family. Father, behold these ones. I'm not seeing them, but you're seeing them. You know where it pinches them. You know why they are crying to you every day. You know how they desire to have a good home and how their homes are going bananas. Father, I know you can bring back everything that was lost. Oh, fresh wine into the family life. Those that used to remember the days when they started and today they are no more doing that same. They may have even gone as far as separation or divorce. But you are the one who puts wine, fresh wine into relationship. Let them remember their vows. Let them remember their dreams of building homes. You will help them to come back together. How you're going to do it, I do not know. But I know you are able to do it because you will touch everyone, the place where it matters for him, and he will give in his life or her life unto you. And then the family will stand again. In Jesus Christ's name we have prayed. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the two prayers, any of them, our social media handles, our phone numbers, our website is right on the screen. Please send us a message. Desire to hear from us. I would personally like to pray with you. I would like to meet you if you need counseling concerning the issue of your marriage. God desires that you have a good home because he wants you to succeed. No matter how successful you have been as a businessman, as a professional, if you do not have a home that is befitting, you are a failure in that area. And nobody wants to fail. I don't want to fail in any aspect. If anything, I want to have 100% in everything. What's my thank you today? Thank you for doing that. God will protect you and keep you and keep your family. In Jesus Christ's name, I have prayed. Amen.